Time for focus. Today we're heading to Tunisia, where 2011's revolution has often been hailed as the most successful. But since then, unemployment has worsened. The overall rate is 15%, but youth unemployment is far higher. More than a third of young people in Tunisia are jobless. And last month, their frustration spilled over onto the streets. Protesters complaining also of corruption. Chris Moore reports. A sit-in outside the governor's office in Kasserine, central Tunisia. It comes after days of anger over corruption and unemployment. Under the watchful eye of the army, tempers are fraying. I can't wait any longer. If they don't find me a job fast, I'm going to set myself on fire. I've got five handicapped people in my family to take care of. Look, I'm going grey. Not because I'm old, but from stress. I can't sleep properly. I can't take it anymore. I'm so tired. And job hunt fatigue is common in this disadvantaged region, where the state remains a major employer. Here in Kasserine, you need connections inside the local authority. If you know someone high up in the system, they'll give you a job. Otherwise, you're unemployed. And me, I don't have the right connections. I've been looking for a state job for 14 years, and my name still isn't on the list of approved candidates, like Rida Yahui. Rida Yahui, the local man killed protesting against his refusal for public sector employment. His death sparked demonstrations that evoke memories of Tunisia's revolution. For Nasser and Nasri, not enough has changed since 2011. Under the old system, his political activism meant he was barred from public sector work. And these days, he still can't get a job. Colloquially, he's classed as unemployed for security reasons, and he's not alone. I won two appeals in court, but they won't change my status. People are still being punished because of their political opinions. It's a scandal that this is allowed to happen after the revolution. It's a complete joke. Whatever the cause of their discontent, these people are vowing radical action. A hunger strike until the government finds a solution. They say the demands are simple. A few dozen kilometres away, near Sidi Bouzid, Ibrahim has decided waiting for the government is not an option. <laughs> He's launched his own agricultural venture. The 23-year-old is growing seedlings to sell at market. Here we have three varieties, almonds, peaches and plums. Like many farmers here, Ibrahim has no official document proving he owns this land. As he awaits legal recognition, obtaining a loan is impossible and he's working outside the system. I'm doing this illegally, but it's better than becoming a delinquent, stealing, kidnapping, that kind of thing. Because I'm not officially authorised, I have to sell what I produce at a lower price. And when I'm at the market, I risk having my goods confiscated. Administrative problems aside, this region is also lacking in infrastructure, making life even harder for the 40% of the workforce who depend on agriculture. But help is available. Ibrahim takes us to see Nizar, the consultant who guided him as he launched his business. He's asked his protégé to mentor this class of ambitious young women. You need drive, self-confidence, and above all, skills. Vital qualities in a country where one university graduate in three is unemployed. Throughout this region, there are young people with enormous potential. But they need training, especially when it comes to self-confidence. That way we can set them on their path to success.
Despite the efforts of people like Nizar, for decades Tunisia has been divided between the relatively affluent coast and capital and the poorer interior. That's meant an exodus from towns like Kasrin. Kamal left there for Tunis 30 years ago, and ever since he's been eking out a living on this unauthorized market stall, alongside fellow traders from his hometown. We spend all of our days together. We share our possessions. We lend each other money. We're all from the same place, and we all look out for each other. But it's a hard life. The police are always after us. They take our goods away. Then we have to start again from scratch. Tunisia's government acknowledges that developing inland regions is vital but says it has no magic wand to remedy years of neglect. For those who come from the interior, making ends meet at home or elsewhere remains a daily struggle. For more on this, I'm now joined from Control Risks in Dubai by William Lawrence, visiting professor at George Washington University. Hello, thank you very much indeed for your time. Now, how is it that youth unemployment in Tunisia got this bad? Well, the youth unemployment rate for university graduates is about four times the youth unemployment rate for uh, Tunisians with no education. So it, it really is more than anything else. Uh, a lot of Tunisians getting trained and then having nothing to do when they get out. And the traditional public sector doesn't have the space or much for them to do. The traditional private sector can't create the jobs. So Tunisia really needs to start thinking about new ways to, to use all this uh, youth talent, as we saw in the setup piece, uh, in new ways. What, in what ways could uh, Tunisia improve the situation? Is it getting perhaps any outside advice? Um, it's gotten uh, some advice. It hasn't applied much of it. I like to say that Tunisia had two revolutions uh, in 2011, uh, the political revolution, which has more or less succeeded, and a socioeconomic revolution, which has led to almost nothing. And uh, uh, one of the ways uh, that I've been advocating for some time now is a national service. If you have hundreds of thousands of university graduates with engineering degrees and all types of other training, why not put them on projects that they develop in rural poverty alleviation, uh, fighting illiteracy, uh, health projects, electrification projects, renewable energy, uh, water, you name it. I mean, they have the talent. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco in my 20s. Why not send out these kids to work on useful, you could call it a revolutionary national service, uh, but get them out doing something rather than begging for jobs that aren't even that meaningful. Now, the prime minister said that his government has no magic wand with which to tackle unemployment. Doesn't that sound like he's not really taking the concerns of these protesting youth seriously enough? That's what it sounds like. I don't think that's what he tried. He meant to convey. And certainly the U.S. Uh, doubled its assistance. Uh, France talked about a billion more dollars in aid. Uh, but until we have uh, a revolution in thinking in Tunisia about how to uh, put youth to work, particularly in the interior regions and in the south, uh, will have money being dumped into Tunisia but not turned into investments that actually take uh, full advantage of the human potential in Tunisia. Tunisia has one of the most highly educated populations in the whole MENA region. It's emblematic for Africa too, uh, but it really hasn't used that asset uh, to its full potential yet. And that's one of the reasons we had a revolution in Tunisia. You mentioned inner regions, and that, of course, is what the uh, report that we broadcast just before this interview was concentrating on. How long has that been a real issue in the country, that uh, the cities are perhaps getting more of the wealth, more of the jobs? Since Ottoman times, since Roman times. I mean, we've always had coastal development in Tunisia and interior poverty and lack of development. Since the... This new government has fully, has fully taken advantage of uh, uh, the opportunity they had to change the economic policy. Instead, what we've seen is more of the same, this idea, for example, that the coastal interior is going to fund the uh, development of the interior, and uh, uh, that's really not going to work. What we need is concentrated investment in rural and southern areas, uh, uh, and we have never really seen that in Tunisia's history. And what about corruption? Just how big of a problem is that? How widespread? It's a big problem. It's getting worse. 
uh, the five years before the revolution, it took off and it actually has gotten worse since then. And and, and part of what's been going on in Tunisia uh, during the last five years of political reconsolidation is that uh, new new players have come in and taken over some of the corrupt interests of the old elites and not fixed it. Um, but I really see corruption as a symptom of a problem rather than the problem itself. And the problem itself is lack of economic productivity. If you study the ways in which corruption is alleviated, it's by giving economic players new incentives to behave in new ways rather than just throwing people in jail or thinking that if you clean up corruption, you're going to have uh, economic productivity. It's really just one small piece of the overall package of reforms and new uh, initiatives that Tunisia needs. Okay, we'll have to leave it there, William Lawrence. Thank you very much indeed for your time.